So now it's uh, time for the second part, because at this point we knew the malware, we knew how they operated. Now what are you going to do about it? Well, do you remember uh, the guy from the beginning, Eugene Kaspersky? He was at the meeting at the Interpol, and like a good CEO, he was, um, well, uh, how to put this nicely because it's on YouTube. Um, he was uh, saying what kind of cool stuff we were doing and researching. So he was saying that, and uh, next to him was somebody from Europol, and he heard the story. And this guy was like, wow, this is big, you know, this is important. Because at that point, we also had some indications that this malware was spreading to Europe. And Europol said, wow, we need to do something about this. So Eugene said, sure, you know, what is it? So Europol organized a meeting. They sent an email to the banks, and it, in the email was something like, um, bring your malware expert, and that's it. At Europol. In a room, it was uh, smaller than this, fully packed with all the security officers of all the major banks in Europe. And then it started. Well, first, uh, the Dutch police had a so small story. Then Europol had a small story, and then we came. And by that time, the security officers at the bank, they got a little bit nervous because they had no idea what was going on. So my colleague, he was uh, telling this story, and he's a real techie. And the fun thing was that the more enthusiastic he got, the more technical it became. And the more enthusiastic he got, the more nervous the people in the room became because <laughs> they're like, ah, what's shit? what can we do, what can we do? Well, we made a report, and when we had the report, we cannot really distribute it to everybody. We can send it to some banks that we know, but we are not really good at distributing reports. So thank God we had the NCSC, so we sent it to them, and then the NCSC had the report. They send it to the other gov certs in the world, and those send it to their banks. Now this has some advantages. It saves us a lot of work. It also has some disadvantages because we don't have any control over it anymore. And this was also a problem because uh, there was one guy in China again. He thought like, oh, hey, um, hmm. let's see if our Cisco appliance protect against it. Let's go to the Cisco support forum and post all this information which was not supposed to be disclosed. <laughs> so, on the Cisco forum, and then you have to try to get it off the Cisco forum. So you call Cisco Holland, because in America it was uh, Nighten. And they said, yeah, we can only, put you, we can only connect you to um, support and to PR. Which one do you want? Yeah, I don't want any of them, I just want that report gone. Well, after a lot of hassle, we were able to get the report offline, and that was good. But also, other companies learn about your report and they really tried to get it. So they asked from the police if they could get the report, they asked us, uh, they asked from some banks to get the report, and they all said no. But at that point we already knew like, uh oh, this is like out of control, we, don't, we cannot control it anymore. So what you see here on uh, this image is uh, CSI Cyber. I'm not sure if any of you have ever seen it. If you do, uh, in real life, it doesn't work like that. In real life, um, I wake up, bus, train, bus, I'm at work. I open up my laptop, I start analyzing, sending emails, do more stuff, go home, and then the same thing. Uh, that's how a real investigation goes. It's nothing like that. It's not really uh, spectacular. But how do you start researching? Well. We can get data from our uh, KSN, which is the Kaspersky Security Network. It's our cloud solution. And if you agree to participate, unknown files are sent to the KSN. So there we can find malware samples. But the best thing you can do is to find command and control servers. Because if you have a command and control servers, you have access 
to a whole lot of data that is really, really interesting. Because you can see who else is the victim. Uh, you can maybe see new malware versions. Uh, it's also useful information for the police in case they want to chase the criminals. So yeah, we're interested in that. And of course, um, I'm not sure if you guys know, but of course Holland is famous for a few things, uh, all the things you can do in Amsterdam, but also uh, the IT hosting, or uh, sorry, the infrastructure we have, the hosting infrastructure, it's really, really good. So that's why there are also many hosting companies in the Netherlands. And just like as you would expect, there were some Carbonar Command and Control servers in the Netherlands. Now, we want those, but we cannot get them, because we're not the police. So, we go to our friends from the Dutch police, we say, hey guys, we've been analyzing the malware, and we saw that uh, this particular version is connecting to these and these IPs, that are belonging to some servers that are hosted in the, in the Netherlands. Can you guys do anything with it? Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Dutch police on board. They seized the servers, or actually they made copies of it. And then we went to analyze them. It was a joint uh, analysis. And on the first server, mm, uh, nothing. <laughs> Oops. Second server, uh, really interesting. Uh, there were, I think, 300,000 stolen credit card numbers on it, of which, I don't know, 10,000 or 30,000 or something like that were still active. But we couldn't really find much information related to Carbonac. Uh, third server, also really interesting. Different campaign, no Carbonac again. Yeah, and the fourth server, they tried to get it, but it didn't really work out. So, there you are, as a private company, asking the police to seize those servers, and they were all false positives. Because it turned out that the guys behind this campaign put in some decoy IP addresses. Really, really annoying. But thank God, we were able to get a command and control server, or actually another law enforcement agency was able to, and we were allowed uh, to analyze the botnet panel code. And we found um, some interesting, well, how to put this, feature with which we could scan the internet. And with this feature, if you would do a specific request, you would get a very specific reply. And with that reply, we knew that 100% sure this was a Carbonac command and control server. So the next time we found an IP, we only had to do this request to that IP, and if it gave this specific reply, we were 100% sure and the police was able to seize it. Now, like I already said, um, you can do that each time you get a new version of the malware, or you can just scan the whole internet. Uh, that usually takes about two, wa two days if you have a really fast internet connection. And this way, we were able to find new command and control servers. And that's useful because you're able to find command and control servers that will be in use or that were in use and you didn't know about yet. So anyway, we found um, another server located in the Netherlands again. And it was a Friday afternoon. So I sent an email to the police Friday afternoon. Hey guys, I found this in this IP, 100% positive this time, please seize it. Uh, half an hour later, they were on the phone and they said, uh, yeah, two things. Um, first, we will try to get an image. Uh, second, don't call us on a Friday afternoon because there's almost nobody in the office. So, lesson learned, don't call them on a Friday afternoon. So anyway, they were able uh, to seize the command and control server and we found uh, some very interesting data on it. There was, for example, uh, one IP that they used to log in into the botnet panel. And then we were able to also get that server. And on that server, we found lots and lots of information. We found, for example, uh, that the malware, it was spreading to Asia. We saw infections in China. We saw infections in Nepal, uh, Bangladesh, I think. And for some reason in Botswana, I don't know what's, what's going on there, but 
somehow it seemed interesting. On another server, and uh, this was also quite interesting, we found that they hacked a PR agency in America. And probably they used that so they could see uh, what news was coming out about uh, public companies listed on the stock exchange so they could buy or sell some stocks in order to get some money. Now, facts and figures. Um, I'm not sure if you heard about it, but when the report came out, it was called the $1 billion APT. And if I say $1 billion, some of you don't believe me. Well, you have a good point. So let me tell you what we found. Behind me, you can see a puzzle. And we had some pieces of the puzzle. We had pieces of the puzzle from the KSN, where we could see infections. We had pieces of the, pu of the puzzle from analysis of the command and control server. And we had pieces of the puzzle because we worked together with the law enforcement agencies. What we saw was that at least, and that's what we know for sure, 40 financial institutions were infected with this malware. We tried to contact all of them. Uh, about half of them replied. And they said, yeah, we have been targeted. And this is how much money has been stolen. And usually that amount was between two and a half and ten million dollars. And that had to do but with which uh, we believe uh, insurance. Usually insurances cover up, or at least in Russia, where most of the attacks were taking place, up to ten million dollars. So there was not really a big loss for the bank because, hey, they were insured for it anyway. Anyway, um, yeah, based on that and also the data from the police, we were sure that for at least 300 million was stolen. Well, 300 million, that's not 1 billion, so how do you come up with that figure? Well, remember the internet scan. We found this many pieces of the puzzle. And because we found so many pieces, we know that we, there was a lot and a lot that we didn't know. Now, based on the pieces that we had, if that was already 300 million, imagine what the other pieces of the puzzle would resemble. So that's why we came up with that number of 1 billion. Yeah. Now also, um, Like I said, we found many command and control servers, but the law enforcement agencies are not always able to seize that command and control server because it's hosted at a bulletproof hoster. Now, when you go to the bulletproof hoster, you say, hey, we're the police, we want an image of that server. They say, oh, I'm sorry, but I don't know where that server is located. We have like 20 19-inch racks, uh, good luck, and go and search. So you're the police, you say, okay, we will do that, but uh, if we cannot find it, we will just use just use the beep test. Uh, what is the beep test? Well, we, we will just pull the first cable, and if the server is still online, we know that that's the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> so the bulletproof hosting provider replies, oh, sure, you can do that. But um, we have a critical hospital application running on one of those servers. Are you sure you want to kill some people? Ah. OK, so the police doesn't do that. But in the end, they're able to identify the machine. And just as they're about to get the machine, the bulletproof hoster shuts it down. Hard disk encrypted, you're screwed. You know, there's nothing much you can do about it. So that was about the campaign uh, till now. And we thought that it was over because when we made this public, it was in February, it was like huge news. It was all over the news. And also, the malware authors saw this, so they shut down their whole infrastructure completely. Which was good, because the campaign stopped. And that was until <laughs> roughly a month ago. Then a company from Denmark, uh, CSIS, they published that Carbonac was back, and this time in Denmark. We also analyzed the samples, and we indeed saw that Carbonac is back. So the story is still continued.